Hey, uh, so I'm here in Ljubljana, uh, Slovenia. I'm still not sure if I'm pronouncing the name right. Um, what's, you know, so I came here uh, from Bulgaria. I stopped, had a layover in Serbian, in a Serbian airport in uh, Belgrade. And I gotta tell you, it's, um, all these capital cities are gonna look the same the minute they're under EU jurisdiction. And we keep mentioning things like the EU and of course the UN, uh, but there are about 30 or 40 more um, economic and security uh, arrangements. And you know, I think one of them is called the, uh, it's not, not the OECD, but something similar uh, that includes Germany and even the Holy See. Um, one of the problems with these sorts of planned cities um, is that you're trying to sort of get number one in something. And I don't know if there are deals at the very top uh, within these security organizations and economic development organizations to say that once one city becomes the biking capital, uh, another city becomes the green capital, um, and therefore you, you eventually end up with, without the competition that's necessary to keep these kinds of cities um, viable uh, organically. And so this city is actually known as a biking city. Uh, it's supposed to be, you know, the, you know, similar to UC Davis, in California, except that, you know, I've, since I've been to Davis, which is the biking capital of California, I can see a fraud uh, in that area when I see it. And what you've done here in order to get that number one sort of advertisement, um, you know, again, because you're not really trying to attract people, uh, you're trying to attract businesses to come here. And so it doesn't actually have to work. It just has to sort of work. So what they've done here is they've actually just put a biking lane since they can't do it in the road. They put it in the middle of a sidewalk. And um, obviously, being from Davis, you know, we actually have biking lanes. Um, and so this is the kind of sort of institutional scam uh, that worries me about development, especially not, not just in the EU, but everywhere. Uh, because again, it seems to me that what you're doing is you're not trying to attract individuals. You're certainly not trying to attract bohemians uh, simply because you can't afford any of the rents here. Uh, even if you're living like five, six to a house uh, or a condo, there are no houses here. It's all condos. Um, and so, I mean, it's, it's, it's preposterous. And what's really happening here is that the reason this is happening overall um, is be the reason these cities are not really livable is not only because you're trying to attract businesses and investments, whether from billionaire individuals or from multinational corporations, um, it doesn't really matter as long as the money keeps going. The goal, all of these development goals have been subordinated um, into the quest to pay off debt. And what's happened now with the banking sector, because of low interest rates, you know, they will throw money at you, uh, especially if they can touch and feel the investment that you're going to generate. And of course, city development is the way to go. If you're, if you're a bank, you at least can touch something, you can repossess it. Whereas, you know, if you're, even if it's a car or whatnot. And that's the other problem with these developments sort of um, outlines. Um, you know, it's still, you're still dealing with a car-centric city plan uh, in order to facilitate, uh, you know, the oil industry and, and a lot of other in industries that are connected to that, such as plastics. And rather than deal with the underlying sort of cause of these unsustainable types of development in capital cities, all of which are coordinating with each other, um, you create a situation where the debt has to be paid and the banking system trusts certain developers, whether it's Donald Trump, uh, whether it's it's really anybody, Steve Wynn, that's just in the U.S. There are obviously a lot of similar uh, real estate magnates all over the world that we simply don't know about uh, because it's in a different language or we're not connected to the banking or the banking industry. For the most part, in other countries outside the U.S., oftentimes it's still controlled by the state, especially east of Poland um, or anywhere in Eastern Europe. I mean, in, in this country, around 2015, uh, you know, they use the euro and part of, you know, part of using the euro means you have to comply with EU regulations on banking. So they've actually ended up since 2015 trying to get out of the, the state, state run tourism sector. And, and when I say, when, when you talk about state run tourism, what you're really talking about is state run development, like real estate, things you can touch and feel, things that the government um, has, that seems to have, seems to be more comfortable investing in. And, you know, even like someone like uh, in Croatia, which, you know, 20% of its tourism comes, uh, sorry, of its GDP, I think, or either, you know, comes from tourism. And you have someone like, you know, Ivan Isevich, um, one of my favorite tennis players, and certainly the most unpredictable one. Um, you know, he actually ended up partnering with the government 
and getting them backstopped. And when his investments went south, the government of Croatia, Croatia was, I think, on the hook for 1.1 million euros, possibly. Um, but you know, not not a huge amount. You know, you know, but again, that's not the point. The point is, all these all these dollars, all these euros, can be lost simply in the quest to make everything look the same. And the reason it's being done is because you know you have Leeds certified, you have this environmentalist sort of um, cover for massive development, which I'm not opposed to. I like development. The problem is that you know we're focusing on small things without fixing the underlying issues. For example, you know, like the car-centric model. Which means that all these businesses, you know, if you have a car-centric model where you're next to a busy street um, or a street that's connected to a highway that you have to get to, you can't really build condos that I would want to live in because obviously it will be noisy. Even if you build it next to the water, you know, the plan at that point would be, you know, the government owns a, uh, you know, attractive land nearby a water supply um, or nearby the beach, it then sells it to a private developer. Uh, makes money off that, then it makes not only makes money on the sale, but also ends up making money on the sales taxes. Another reason why cars are more favored by governments over a lot of other businesses that might make more sense. Um, with plastics, obviously, you have this whole, all these millions of dollars trying to go into resolving the plastic issue without resolving the oil and gas driven industry that's behind it. So, you know, you're looking around and, and why is this happening? It's happening because, you know, in the old days, you sort of, if you were in debt, you conquered another country and put them in debt, like Germany, twice. And they had to pay reparations. And what's happening now is my, my fear is that you don't really need to conquer another country to put them in unsustainable debt. And this has been brought up before by critics of the IMF, but it's not just the IMF. It's, you know, banks worldwide, countries worldwide have import, export, and infrastructure banks. Um, they use that to use their stronger currency to invest in other countries because in some ways capitalism, the critique of communism against capitalism was that capitalism was a pyramid scheme. And in some ways that's absolutely correct. Um, but the, the saving grace of capitalism has always been choice. I don't have to you know, go into a, a, a government owned store and get the government cheese that you've ordered or that, you, or that you've made because of your connections with farmers um, uh, you know, in the socialist compound. I can go there and get my own. And not only that, but I can compete. If I don't like your cheese, I can open up my own shop and compete with you. Um, the fear again is that if it takes you know, a, a million dollars from, from a bank just to open up a competing business, You've actually got capitalism with, you know, the worst sort of pyramid scheme um, possible, along with the downsides of socialism, um, at least in implementation. And so when you look at Eastern Europe, the reason it's been so successful is because it's not because they've managed to build all these nice buildings. They've simply co-opted a mafia, um, which oftentimes controls cement, concrete, um, and they've called that a success, which is, again, what I call the Las Vegas model. It can be a success. But I would say that just like Las Vegas, very few people would want to live there long term. And so that forces Las Vegas to be more competitive in education. It, it can experiment more and that's a good thing. But it's able to do that because it's competing with states nearby like California, a lot of other places for talent. And a country like this, and especially in the EU where you have competing languages that make it more difficult for non blue collar workers to go back and forth, um, it's doubtful, at least in the near future, whether that same Las Vegas model will be successful. And ultimately, you still want a, a unified Europe because of all the wars that have been happening here. Um, it's hard to say, given history, that the Europeans were not the most savage people in the world. And in, and in the United States, of course, just a nation of European refugees. You can call them European rejects, but you know, they're really European refugees. Um, and who fled the country, not just because of the French Revolution, but because of all the wars happening here. You would have to be crazy to stay here with, you know, plague and the Spanish Inquisition, World War I, World War II. Um, and that's not even just the cross-border wars, you know, um, all of which seems to have, have created an environment where people are perfectly happy looking the same and entering into these sorts of co-opting um, co agreements with different banks and uh, international organizations uh, in order to create a place that's that's sort of photographic, um, that's pleasantly photographic. The problem is that just like New Orleans in, in you know the French Quarter in, in the U.S. 
in Louisiana, the minute you leave that French Quarter, you're in some cases entering into what some people might call a ghetto, or a nicer term would be underdeveloped, or just a place with shopping malls. Um, and again, that's not sustainable. Uh, it's particularly not sustainable because it increases inequality as a matter of design. If your prices over here are being, if your houses over here and the condos are being funded by foreign investors or foreign infrastructure banks, they're doing that in a stronger currency so they can sit there, they can wait. Um, and most importantly, they don't have to worry about long-term livability here because they're not living. The owners of the condos may have agreements with um, the builders um, locally uh, and local banks, but especially because you know that's sort of the point of the EU, right? You have this overall jurisdiction um, and resolution process that steps in when necessary to resolve conflict. So you don't end up going a physical war or economic war. Uh, in some cases, that's led to what I've just talked about, which is partitioning, you know, all this sort of advertisements about you know being biking capitals and so on. And you know, it's still like I said, it's still a nice place. I mean, the city is known for its green spaces, um, and it's apparently under one metric as I think something 2000 um, has the, there's a lot of, you know, it's, not, it's so many different metrics, not just, you know, the World Heritage uh, or UNESCO, a, the Europeans are flexing their cultural muscles by coming up with their own um, sort of metrics that other people can measure by and that, you know, other people can, can aspire to, which again is a good thing. Um, it shows a lot of confidence, but my problem again is that, that you've got these buses. I don't think there's a stuff with bus lane. You know, I just wouldn't want to live here. Uh, it's a nice place, but I sort of if you want to look at Disney. You know, people call Singapore Disneyland for adults. That's what this place is. Singapore is a nice place to live uh, if it wasn't for the weather. Um, but yeah, what, two buses? So what? There's only like so apparently this might only be a bus lane and a bike, and you've got bikes crisscrossing the street because the city planning. You know, what do you do? Right, the whole city cities in Europe were designed for horses and carriages. And when the new new technology showed up, which is cars and asphalt, uh, you just sort of, you know, can't really destroy these buildings unless you go to war. Um, and the whole place is bombed out, which happened in Bulgaria and Sofia. Sorry, I shouldn't say the whole country. And then you've got a totally different design. So if you're young, you come here and you like it. If you're a little bit older and you've been to more places, you sort of see that it's not necessarily sustainable. And you see that a lot of this is coming in from, you know, compliance with EU. Uh, regulations, which is in some cases very good. These buildings will last a long time. Uh, there will, will be probably one bookstore somewhere. Um, you know, you're, deal you're dealing with investors that are known as opposed to unknown. And even if they are, you know, connected to the mafia, um, you know, you're still putting them into a legitimate framework uh, that they can't necessarily escape from using extra, judi extra judi judicial means like violence. Um, so, but that also means that the system has to keep going in debt over and over again. Prices have to keep going up, which of course leads to inequality. And then it creates a competition between the agricultural centers and the city centers. And so you end up with the same problems that the United States is having now, uh, where the more, where the less developed areas are now completely disconnected socially uh, from the more developed areas. And so this sort of Las Vegas model works in, Las, in Nevada because, again, it's competing overtly for residents, uh, but it's not, I don't think it's going to work. I mean, it's going to look nice on tourism brochures. Um, and of course, the, you know, the shift in Eastern Europe from publicly owned banks and insurance companies um, and all these different sectors that allow these sorts of investments to be made uh, in a stable way, you know, all of that uh, is now being privatized, in some cases in a very good way, like Kazakhstan. Um, but again, in some cases, you sort of wonder, you know, <laughs> whether anybody would actually want to live here because you can't really own anything. Um, you can probably open up an Airbnb. Um, I, I'm, I'm actually in an Airbnb. Um, my, uh, my host sleeps on the couch, right? So whenever somebody shows up, um, he makes money and then he goes out and sleeps in the living room and I get his bedroom. It's a nice bedroom. Um, and, but again, overall, you know, when I first started traveling, it was all about, let's see what's going on out there. Uh, and now a lot of it is, let's see if I actually want to live here. Um, and I can tell you, if you're going to have a system anywhere, not just in the EU, with the exact same stores, got an H&M. Uh, I don't know who shops there, by the way. Um, if it's all the same, you can order it on Amazon. 
uh, I'm just really curious as to how these buildings are going to work um, and who's shopping the, you uh, know, who can, who has access to Amazon, which puts me firmly on the side of Jeff Bezos. Uh, and I've worked in retail. I know this is completely, this is old school, um, simply because you can order so much more online and to the extent that your product gets there from a warehouse that's set up exactly like Costco uh, and Amazon. And so it's actually completely inefficient. These malls are completely inefficient if what, if what you're looking for is a product itself. That doesn't matter if you're old school, if your economy runs on oil, cars, and the taxes that are generated from that system. Uh, that means you like places like H&M and Mango. They, they give you a flavor that you don't necessarily have. But when you go to developing countries, that's also why you don't see these stores. Um, not because it's unaffordable, but because it makes more sense for food businesses to show up. Um, because a lot of the products that are manufactured in those countries um, are actually for export only. Uh, again, currency fluctuations and also just the fact that most countries that still manufacture things have weak currencies, so they can't actually buy the products uh, that they're making, uh, which is why it's for export. And sometimes you see that on when you buy something export quality. Um, it's now like an advertising thing. So it all looks nice. I um, got like cafes, but you've got your McDonald's down there. Um, would I want to live here? No. Do I think people here are going to be the sort of the uh, Height Ashbury 1960s? Do I think the next Allen Ginsberg is going to show up here? No. No way. Who knows where those people will show up? But it won't be here.